Um, I, you know, it's been quite a few years since I first stepped into a post fire forest. It was May 14th, 2014. And at first, uh, if some of you might have seen either the trailer and or the actual film, uh, The Searching for the Gold Spot, um, I just want to uh, introduce a humbling moment for me, which was that my brother-in-law and sister are both incredible filmmakers and editors and uh, making award-winning films. So <clears throat> he took me aside and said, Mayu, this is good documentation, but it's not a film. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I encourage everyone to go out and explore and start with good documentation because it's just the recipe for incredible discovery and uh, a feeling of intimacy in these landscapes that are largely misunderstood as I'm going to try to take you through some moments I've been out there. Um, today I want to start with a poem or actually it's a poem fragment because um, I wrote it a few days ago just trying to conjure up the moments when I'm up out in the field and it's uh, it's a cold, not so, you know, great environment, sometimes just camping out between different camera efforts. And uh, this is one of the wonderful moments on a summer, summer evening. And then it transitions out of the evening. Time is the penknife in my pocket of felt and softness, holding the places I've opened baked beans or soup on a cold, cold night's blues held between stick trees and the sound of a bird's feathers as it shakes the raindrops off somewhere above us. A sense of safety despite all the dying, a sense of home. The light has gone, the light is yet to arrive. And the world around my dome tent is filled with strange, dark pacings, sounds being dreamt or experienced, clickings and rustlings underfoot, a curiosity, a hunger, a drifting. And from the world outside, now come the diurnal sounds of bustling and getting ready. How quickly the light has arrived the leaves still dripping, now in brilliance, flashing, and the birds announcing themselves and their personal spot on the earth. The creek, freshly swelled, delivering a thousand messages to a thousand more, as if there were no other moment more important than this one. Actually, I'm trying to get to something and, and this piece was sort of one of my little moments of intimacy in the landscape because what I actually heard outside the rustlings and clickings were uh, ended up being a mountain lion. So, and it, it came to the camera at some point. So, and I'm hoping it comes to the camera at some point soon. I've got plenty of cameras remote cameras out there in uh, Stanislaw National Forest, which has been one area of focus for me. So, so what's that story all about? You know, when I walked in, in May, 2014, I was a little bit sort of taken aback to say the least. What's all this, you know, what's all this black what's what's all this charcoal all about how how can i reconcile just the fact that we all care about biodiversity as biologists as writers as poets as artists but then you walk into this really foreign landscape and i and i realized that actually it's foreign but is it foreign to itself is it something that's at at home with itself and over the years realized that in fact, these places unfurl, they just need a little time. Not only do they unfurl in the sense of 
the botanical world, the plants, the flowers, the rare fire followers, the common fire followers, the clarkia, the lupins, but they also unfurl in terms of a real busyness of, of wildlife, which I'm now following more of, um, which is um, mammals. So I want to sort of help uh, walk us through some of the visuals. Um, so I'm going to share the screen for a little bit, but I don't want to share the screen for the whole time because there's some stories and uh, to share. So um, some of these images, if you have seen parts or all of Searching for the Gold Spot, are going to be a little familiar to you. Um, so I'm actually going to start a slideshow from the beginning. This is a mountain bluebird. It's up in Plumas National Forest. And uh, there's two chicks in there. You can only see one. And it's it was it sort of was the first year. That first year was all, and actually the first three or four years were all about bird surveys in these wild spaces that are called snag forests, often next to, you know, sort of living trees, swaths of living trees, swaths of standing dead. And usually I found that these birds, a huge group of birds went for the standing dead trees because that's where they could knock the holes in and um, the cavities where they'll raise their young. And um, I forgot this funny little wind <laughs> transition between slides, which I rather like. And this is a California quail in another snag forest in the, in the, within the Sierra Nevada. And this little fellow started singing because it was his time to be very territorial in the spring. You can see it's a nice summer day. Another snag forest, if it wasn't for that beak of a little chick op wide open, this little flycatcher would not be visible. I mean, she, they are so cryptic and that little bright yellow orange beak gives the whole thing away. This is an early morning in Stanislaw National Forest, again a snag forest and it's a, just a perfect picture for a, you know, a little place for nesting. One of the, one of my own discoveries was the mysteries of the black-backed woodpecker. And they're the first, sort of like a keystone species in a way, like lots of other species depend on them. They're coming in right after a fire and they're grabbing what, exactly what you see in there, which is the, the wood boring beetle larvae that everybody is talking about these days with the beetle kill and charred forests and oh my gosh, but here's the black-backed woodpecker zooming in and with great precision, I'm sure it has to do with listening and with the beak, of course, beak action, boom. He nails them one after another. And of course, off he goes to feed his little chicks. And the lower part of the slide is that backdrop of this incredible regeneration that is now, okay, now this was 2015. Uh, yeah, June 2015, the lower part of the slide, now that the, those tr little trees are taller than I am, it's just, it's amazing. Of course, it has been a few years, but look at that regeneration capacity. You've got the little pines, the firs, the cedars, they're all in there. And of course, the mix of the grand, the wildflowers, which you can't see over there. Um, so... I, the, the surveys that I started with was, were pretty much blackback woodpecker surveys. A big team of folks were uh, doing blackback woodpecker surveys. And I got to see this, the little, the little bird with the big personality. <laughs> and it was, there he is, um, spitting out the sawdust from his, his uh, nest cavity that he's building. So that's a close-up of that um, 
woodpecker in a fire kill tree, uh, which is called snags, of course, in Inyo National Forest. Um, let's see, I don't want to, I'm going to speed through some of these. This is regeneration year 2018, I think. Yeah, this was 2018. And for scale, which, because since I'm not there in the, in the shot, it's, it's a little above waist high right now. Um, three years. And then 2019, unfortunately, this particular area, which is the second part of my story, uh, it went down to, um, to a removal. It was, it was part of a very large removal unit. So I had just, I had pretty close to, you know, 40 or 50 different species of birds, 90 total in the greater rim fire forests in these particular areas, like that, that gorgeous in between, between the black snags and then the live patches and just, they were just thriving in there. So this is one of the ones that, that fell to, uh, it was a harvesting unit, which I'll talk about a little bit. And there's the chicks. <laughs> They'll rattle on and on. They beg all day if they're growing actively, ready to fledge. They're just, yeah. Um, and that's the, that's the dad with one of the chicks in a different part of the forest. I've been, I've probably monitored and, and or found 12 nests. So just seeing how busy they are coming back and forth it's probably you know they'll probably take 20 25 trips in the morning feeding the chicks um this was a woodpecker nest that failed actually this little guy was very territorial but he was knocking against his his own nest tree uh, nest snag quite a bit and that probably uh, gave him away a little bit i don't know what happened to him but the nest, he was not active after two more days. Um, one of the things about blackbacks, and in the previous slide, you should see that gold background. And then here you see that sort of beige background in a more or less live tree with bugs in it, okay? So most of the trees they're gonna use are black with the bugs in them because the, the wood boring beetle larvae just get into those snags so fast. So these guys are so conspicuous in trees where, you know, you don't have that same backdrop. And so that's possibly why they won't bear as well in, it's, it's a big complex picture, I know, with the ecology of it, but this is probably one of the reasons is they stand out so much in, in that gold backdrop or in this beige backdrop. This one, um, he has a white-headed woodpecker, a little more versatile. It'll go into some of the snag forests and then it goes into, it, it goes into that in-between section between the patches of living and then the patches of standing dead trees. Um, and, you know, on and on with, here's the Northern Flicker, there's so much diversity out there. These are all using these snags, the, the standing dead trees. And you can even see little holes, you know, sort of the wood, the beetle larvae holes in the bark of the tree. And there's a little chick begging. He's, he's getting ready to get out. Um, so, you know, I showed the, the first slide was a, was a, mountain blue but this is a western they both have the same habit they'll pick out one of the unused nests and go for it uh, but the woodpeckers are the carpenters so they're the ones building and then you know these guys the bluebirds not hatches and um chickadees will use the nest created by the woodpeckers another this is a mountain bluebird very territorial mountain bluebird showing off um and and you know then there's swaths of other birds that use the the budding chaparral that comes up and they're sort of ground nesting or close to ground nesting and this is a green-tailed towhee in the middle of an aspen snag forest an aspen burn in inyo national forest um tanagers so um, 
And in the in-between section between the burn swaths, the non-burn swaths, and pretty close to a meadow most times, there'll be great gray owls. Now you can see from that backdrop on, on the snag, it's, it's a snag for sure, it's a standing dead tree, huge, beautiful old cedar snag. And it, ha it, did, it did change structure during the fire as you can see from that backdrop. And that's the mom. And you can see where she's hunting. Again, another snag forest, very exciting. Uh, great, great, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, spotted owls also use the snack for us. I've actually recorded spotted owls going in in the dark. Of course, then, of course, my kind of camera won't work anymore. But going into the, the snag for us in the dark and it's just dropping down to the ground to when they find something because there's so much action on the forest floor that's rapidly growing. Uh, goshawk, same story with the goshawk. Uh, you can see from the little spiky pine needles in the backdrop that this is a live tree that she's nesting in. She's got a couple of chicks in there already. They're very tiny and um, right behind her, like literally 20, 30 feet behind her is a big snag patch of a you know, black and charcoal forest where she and her mate go hunting. So this was, this was uh, you know, hours and hours just watching these guys. And then of course you got the little ones. Oh, I'm sorry, there were three of them. <laughs> I forgot. Oh, that's, it's really cool to see three and they weren't fighting, which means that they had resources, which means that they were, you know, sometimes raptors, uh, little chicks will throw the other one off. They'll compete so much, so ferociously for food when there's less resources they can easily, easily throw another one off and nothing like that happened on this nest. Same nest. <laughs> this is, this is uh, footage. <laughs> you hear it. I hope this is working for everyone. We're trying to whisper. I was, I was in this place from early in the morning. Like I started at two in the morning. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then by nine or 10, uh, you know, lights getting burned a little bit. And um, so most recently I've been, let me just see. I was, uh, I was going to the larger predators and this is one of the mountains. I don't think this is the mountain lion that was outside my tent, that first poem I read. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a different one. But I've been, you know, sort of putting cameras out in the wild, um, and this this is another area. This is actually just a few feet away from that first mountain lion slide. Um, this is a ringtail cat. This is a this is actually a brand new slide in a very exciting part of the Dixie Fire of 2021, where um, it's called Tasmam Koyam. It's, some of you may know it as Humbug Meadow. It used to be called that, but it's now called Tasman Koyam. And uh, the Maidu Consortium, it's part of their land now. And it's, uh, this is an exciting story of post-fire recovery here. This ringtail was very comfortable and uh, stayed for a long time uh, right in front of the camera. Um, this is a long tail weasel. Another part of Rimfire in uh, Stanislaw. Again, looking at Stanislaw, two foxes, one in the backdrop. And Bobcat, baby Bobcat. Now this one is from West of Fieldsburg, Walridge Fire. Baby Bear. <laughs> Um, and a cub and a mom that seems pretty skinny, unfortunately. Chowing on the, again, here you go, insects in the bark. Important for a lot of the large mammals. So just at the same time with all this, all this exciting wildlife uh, action happening, there's just so much regeneration of the snag forests. Um, so I'm going to transition real quick to um, some of the some of what I've seen of thinning, you know, thinning 
forests is you know forests go through treatments sometimes and and part of the treatment is is thinning and and uh, but you know it can it can really vary how they do after fire and so once if they burn if they don't do really well after fire which happens quite a bit um then then it results in sort of a clear cut and so that that's um that's been the subject of a study a couple of studies um one done by some of my colleagues and uh here's a little great gray, gray uh, excuse me a gray fox and this is going to be i think my last slide um in a, another swath of snag forest that was taken down and i think i i want to end there um let's see and i'm a quick transition to another poem before i talk a little bit about some of those images that were you know a little sadder because you don't you definitely don't want to see animals gone from an area where they were thriving i have um a poem called rejuvenation that i've been experimenting with film and i just want to um sort of share share that poem as a transition to um yeah to the to the little bit more slightly sadder part of the story. <laughs> Rejuvenation. Once we have looked away, once we have mourned and banished all smoldering thoughts about the tribe of blackened trees, replacing the known world for now and another season. And the last long fingers of smoke have been ushered out by wind. A ticking begins. No one has seen them arriving in such numbers, but the birds are neither lost nor passing through. They are simply linked tight to the newborn sense of ash and rain, to the promise of white fruits, the riches concealed by bark. So were the ways of ancestors who began their journeys as specks in the distance some 50,000 years ago or more, riding the miles of smoky gold along a known line of hunger, growing closer and closer, the rufous beat of instinct, working a migration upstream against the flow of smoke into the source and its multiple treasures. The living are awake to the growth and profusion soon to follow. They will grow with the diligence of all known colors unfurling from the soil's chocolatey darkness, from the trees regreening come spring, from the blackness. Um, so I sort of use that poem as a little bit of a transition because I, have experienced wildfire coming at Sonoma County, you know, three last, uh, three big wildfires in the last few years. And last, 2020 was glass fire and also the Wallbridge fire, which I've been monitoring. That little baby bobcat was from the Wallbridge fire. So the part that I've been seeing, which is, is a little more hard to take is, is that, because of in part because of our as fear in part because of our idea of aesthetics that a tree has to be green it has to be rich it has to be vibrant you know vibrant verdant you know that everything related to green that when you see the stick forest the, the charcoal forest it's there's a wave of fear and there's a wave of gosh how is that going to act in the next fire is that going to burn is that going to drop is that going to be a hazard and so all these homes for animals and um, areas where animals burrow down under a snag that comes down and starts sort of um, recycling back into the soil and that becomes great place for foxes to, to den. Um, 
all of them seem to be a threat, even in the wild, even, even far away. So that's when it starts becoming, should we take this out? You know, what's going to happen to us if we don't, you know? And so it's like the animal condos, the animal housing, the animal real estate, the animal sense of time, the animal sense of progression and the waters and the, all those parts of the cycle where carbon slowly goes back in and it does that with oyster mushrooms and, and morel mushrooms and conch shells on the trees and this, they're all doing this grand dance over time to bring things back to soil. And, also, and of course, then there's our fear, very real. I know this because we had fire really close by. And then the idea is, can we take it all out and then start again and be safe, you know? And the, and the long-term studies have proved that it seems, I think, it's just an aesthetic. You know, which is why I wanted to get so much into film, that the long-term studies are saying, actually, a snag forest is not going to burn any faster, readier, um, heavier, more intense than, than a regular one. And they're just going to fire as part of their language, and that's how they've evolved. So these this cycle of standing and gradually dropping and then recycling trees that you've seen like the baby bear was on a, a tree that's sort of melting into the soil um the, the pair of foxes were in there that cycle belongs there and it that carbon is part of that what's happening now is you know um going to okay what do we do with all this you know should we should we uh okay when you log it right away of course it can be used as lumber that's cool um, but if you log it after a long time, it gets burned as biomass. That's all going up into the uh, atmosphere. So there's, a, there's this whole gut-wrenching series of fears we go through that can clash in some ways with what the forest is trying to do. It's trying to stand up. It's trying to heal. It's, you know, things are making a little comeback. And they are, you know, and anybody who says they're not can take a look at the data i have plenty but i mean i haven't done official studies but i the data that i have are like a companion visual companion to many official studies the longest done by dr richard huddo starting after the the great yellowstone fire and seeing 23 years what happened this amazing environment so um so that's you know i um i want to uh, I think, Carly, I think I have a few more minutes, right? You do. Okay, great. So, you know, I do have another um, quick slideshow. I'm going to just close off the, um, the first one. And then, yeah, you know, the, the whole idea of fire safety. And I just want to bring this up because thousands of case studies are, you know, sort of giving us a chance to um to understand what 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 is it that that'll keep us safe um so i'm just gonna run through these real quick um back to screen sharing i'm i'm glad i did this you know where you know, there was a bit of screen sharing and then then i came back in <laughs> so otherwise you watch a screen the whole time um let's see let me just okay great so yeah um so that you know that those classic studies, I'm, I'm just gonna run through these real quick and I'm sure this will come up in questions. So all the better, you know, this, this is so much, you know, to get information, but, but really, you know, these are friends who've been doing rebuilds. I've been monitoring them after fires. You can see in the backdrop that, well, maybe you can't see the screen of green in the backdrop of the photo because it's small, but that area went through fire and then a second fire. Um, and so they're doing things, you know, with that hundred foot, the classic hundred foot, uh, anything you see that's closer, you know, that's just because of the angle of the photograph I got, but, but, you know, the stucco and the tile and, and the landscaping around and, and this, by the way, is a, a photo of a, um, 
a home and survived the glass fire. And look at that. He's got that distance. He's, he's you know, he's maintained. He's got the trees are all around. He, he, in fact, those trees that uh, right after the fire, uh, some people say, oh, my gosh, that's just, oh, my gosh, that must be dead. Well, if you wait for a year, a lot of them are actually alive. It's that immediate gut level reaction that you you took take a look at that landscape and have that <gasps> that oh moment you know. Um, but in fact, um, he and I were talking about those that screen of trees behind him. Of course, the home wasn't affected, and his second home wasn't affected either. Um, that's because of the wisdom of doing that defensible space. Now the problem is when we presume it's dead. Um, or dying, which is like redwoods, you know, redwoods are the king of post-fire survival um, with what they call epicormic branches. They, they just branch right out of the trunk, but yeah, well, they're taken down because of our fear factor. And you can see a lot of them, you know, where, where I've been monitoring, a lot of them are actually pretty good to go. You know, this in the middle of doing their redwood thing to come back and you know, it's just, uh, you know, our fear factor will um, take them down. So um, that's a slide I showed before, but here you go with, um, this is a campfire paradise slide. And you can see this is the place that campfire came from. And uh, there's a lot of sort of a variegated pattern of on the left, with the clear cuts and the thinning and uh, that fire went pretty fast through those areas because you know we can see that later on you know so you know is all thinning created equal that's the question is all clear cutting created equal how how does it does it serve us you know that's always this question and of course when we take it down lumber obviously holds some of the, the wood in but but in fact, most of that wood gets burned in biomass. It's, it's all gone, biomass energy. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, I know this is super fast, but I wanted to take you through some of the home safety areas. Uh, this, this is the um, story of the Creek Fire where 19, I don't say 99% of the homes or more uh, survived the fire. This is an LA County area close to a forest. So this is, um, there are some amazing fire survival stories out there. And uh, I think, you know, I wanna, I always wanna think, you know, what's the give and take between our safety and their safety, our survival and their survival, you know, uh, can we can we keep it going for these these animals that uh, like the great gray you know here in California it's actually there are not that many of them so th this population close to Yosemite and in this is in Stanislaw is one of the f you know there there's just down to a few hundred right now so you know then then the questions become bigger you know these are bigger questions now how much how much is too much that's my big mantra. How much is too much? You know, um, that's a little bear I was showing you before, and he's on a fallen snag in the snow. All right. Well, um, I am going to escape that. And because I think I'm pretty close to time. So I know I went through a lot, and I would love for you to hear your questions. I'm um, my answers can be a little long, so I'm going to try to uh, maybe, if, if you want, I can do another poem, but I'm happy to open it up for questions, and then if there's time, I can always continue later. Yeah, Maya, um, thank you. Thank you so much, and we would love to hear another poem, so maybe let's do a couple questions and then leave some time um, at the end so that we can close with a poem, if that sounds good to you. Sure. Um, and thanks, everyone. Uh, we welcome you to, um, to put your questions in that Q&A feature there. Um, Maya, you've talked about these two stories, this um, story of recovery and regeneration. And then there's this 
darker story, um, you know, of, of humans who are, you know, with uh, plenty of reason fearful um, of fire at times. Um, how do you hold those two things, um, those two stories in your work? Um, maybe I could say several ways. One of them I have to say is with, with dread. When I see, for example, the great gray um, is very, very close to, I'd say maybe a quarter of a mile from a clear cut right now that just happened recently. So, you know, uh, so dread and then compassion for the fact that, you know, I felt it, you know, when I was running out of here, my home with a few suitcases and then later thinking, oh, my mom's saris. What on earth? There was a suitcase right there. I could have taken it. What if I can't, you know, what, what if I never see them? What, you know, and so I, I know those questions. I, I've. I've been there, but I want, so there's compassion because there's, there's so much I understand about the dread that I felt when I first saw the knee jerk, knee jerk reaction when I first saw the very first snag force very early after fire. And then you had to really look, you know, all the way to the tops of the trees to see those little green pine needles mm -hmm. growing in in a tree that looked like basically burnt so it, it was I was it was there was this gut-wrenching feel you know like whoa 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 and so I came a long way so I understand so there's compassion but also great excitement my goodness the life out there it's partly because there's so much budding up you know like there's that cover that's gone. And so now you've got all these little guys, all the plants and the mice and the gophers and the squirrels. And so then we got the predators coming in and you know, layers and layers and just circle after circle after circle, like a series of ripples of increasing activity, which is what I've seen over and over, not one, not two, not 15, not 16, but every single forest. I've been to now now of course finally Sonoma so yeah sense of hope and sense of sense of dread <laughs> um thank you for that uh, I, another question um are you seeing the conversation around logging snag forests evolving in recent years so does it seem like there's any kind of awakening about the importance of intact snag forests now yeah so my understanding is that I don't think snag forests have a status. It's like, you know, um, you know, maybe if I came here 100 years ago, I wouldn't be called, you know, Asian American, I'd be called, who's that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so snag forests are at that point where it's who's that? Who's that? You know, that's what they are now. They don't have a status. So my feeling is they need to have a status, you know, like mm -hmm. um, I'm not seeing that coming. It's just a lot of fear with a lot of fire. It's also a, a big chance for any one of you out there who wants to go out and document. If you want me to give you a few of the secret places, I will do that. It is so important. I cannot even emphasize it enough and you will be amazed guaranteed so that's part of it it's it's us really you know we need to develop that compassion and and also it is a logging industry you know but you know that's because it's been recognized by it's sort of a feedback right we mm -hmm. think it's garbage they think it's garbage you know it's it's a back and forth we need to also stand up <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. so yeah you bring such a unique combination of perspectives to your work and, and to a forest. I imagine you walking into a forest and you have all these different lenses that you can look through. Um, how did you come to have all of these different ways of knowing and of looking at the world, this poetry and biology and now through photography and film? Um. Poetry started first. I, you know, sort of, we were, 
if, if I think about it, which I never have before, but we were, as my father's in the foreign service, so we were always in foreign countries. We were in foreign countries constantly. So being alien, being a foreigner in another country, Bhutan, Burma, Myanmar, uh, which is now Myanmar, um, Afghanistan, England, Netherlands, was sort of a habit. And so um, poetry was sort of a language I could occupy in that other place and always feel at home. It was a, it, it always started, it started a very intimate landscape to me. Biology followed and film was last. And I'll tell you what happened with film. When I first walked into those forests, that first day, May 14th, 2014, I thought, if I don't film this, if I only write about it, no one's going to believe me. That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> Um, well, we are getting comments of people who are believing you and, and being really thankful. One um, person saying that they'll, they'll never look at a snag forest the same way again. And thank you so much. Uh, and that that's such a great point that they don't have um, status. Um, someone else asks you, what can we do to change the conversations we're having about fire so that it's less stigmatized or so we're you know seeing the nuance that you're talking about? Um, oh gosh I would say it's this is such a rich field in a way right no one is out there I'm telling you when you go out there whoever you are no one's out there you're going to be with your friends and that'll be it you know there might be some wise hunters who who get it really they get it and they come over there might be some some super wise, you know, sort of poet, poet type people or photographer, you know, they, they'll be the occasional people. But I'll tell you what, they will, you will, for the most part, be alone. And so you got this, the world at your feet, you know, so that's one thing to do. The other thing, which is possibly a companion factor, and it's probably more important even, is to start at home, making home super, super, super safe. You know, my goodness, home hardening and defensible space. You know, look at, um, we're looking at the dark side, right? With, with home safety, there are some bright side stories. There's one in Idaho and there's at least two in LA because LA is super strict. You know, even here in Sonoma, we're not that strict yet. Can you imagine? Coffee Park was rebuilt, and I don't know that it's as far as safe. I mean, but in LA, they have these strict laws. So it's like, it's about your little space that needs to be so safe that it's, you know, it stands. And, and then the conversation can keep going. And guess what? Out there, it really burned, and that was good. And out here, it's really a home standing, and that's good, <laughs> you know. And then we can start that conversation, you know. Yeah. Thank you, because um, that is, yeah, that is the fear, um, and with reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder if um, I'm looking through here at. At questions and there's a lot of specific um, questions about um, thinning and um, sort of um, approaches and I wonder if you have any suggestions where people could you know resources that people could turn to if they want more specific information um, you mentioned some studies uh, what would you point us to as sort of a good entry point um, for folks who are just learning to learning about the science yeah, I'm going to look it up and, and, and I probably want to do this. I, I would love to look at the chat, but I know I'll be like, oh, and that and that. And, that, you know, so I'm not going to right now, but I will love to give you a series of mostly case study based. I like to just get on the ground, see what happened there, you know, that kind of thing. And so the latest would be bootleg fire because you're in Oregon. And a couple of colleagues have been writing about that. In fact, one in... A uh, couple of them wrote in what was it called Grist magazine, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then somebody's been doing a lot of mapping. My colleague Brad Baker has been do doing some mapping. Um, Chad Hansen has been doing some work. Um, 
uh, Rick Halsey is doing a lot of fire safety Southern California work. There's a bunch of studies. I'd love to, I'd love to share share with you. So absolutely. Um, um, Great. And Shelly yeah. just put that um, link to the Grist article that you mentioned in chat. So she's she's working with us there. Um, I wonder if you would close us out with a poem this evening, Maya. Um, sure. And by the way, there are two Grist articles. One was, um, I think, written by a Nature Conservancy folks. And then there was a second one. So I'll, I'll send you both. Um, it's really good to have both stories. You know, my dad, this is what I, how I was brought up. And this is what, one thing I want to um, talk about is, you know, how do you make up your mind? There's so much information. My dad always said, never read one newspaper, read two or three opposing newspapers and make up your mind. <laughs> so, uh, of course, that can get confusing, too. I, un I understand that. So, um, all right. So I was going to end in a fun one with a fun moment. Do we have a hard stop at seven? Is that what happens? Um, as close to that as we can. So if you've got a piece that's a little longer, please feel free. Yeah, you know, uh, as I'm looking through for a for another fire fire poem. Um, okay, so the latest. Uh, well, for me, it's a discovery, but it's been known that the Pacific fisher, which is not a very common animal, uh, has been found in a post-fire forest in, in Stanislaw National Forest, one in, several in Yosemite in the post-fire forest, and the very latest, I've been working up at the Dixie Fire, which is a little closer to you, uh, Lassen. I've been working with uh, several colleagues and there's Pacific fishers right there in the heart of the burn um, in the La in the Dixie Fire. They just, they, you know, so, hey, that comeback, that comeback happens so quickly. So um, let's see, I might, it looks like I've got time for one. I should probably just, it's sort of a little bittersweet, <laughs> but this is also a, you know, a fire poem in some ways. It's called Mountain Quail. On the far side of absence, a clean drop, a mist driven dawn, one quail foraging where there have always been two. A lean season, air spiced with the chopped and fallen bark of fir and cedar. Her chest is afire with agitation. I too straighten my neck for the encounter. In the pause, she scratches the dirt, the maw left by bulldozers and pecks. Persistence is the strongest of fruits. Even the whole halved seeks to function as whole. Even after their whole hold lies loosened, roots dangling askew, leaves continue their drive through the murk, drawing from fists entrenched in clay. The quail is surrounded by a swirling, a white outed cliff below. Generations of wisdom have equipped her to perceive my prolonged attention as a threat. The moment flees into the unthinkable. I cannot help bushwhacking towards the drop, leaning over the sheer face. Far below, she's clinging to the edge of life the way we all do. The scratches stinging my face and arms too will all but vanish. I think I have time for a small one, short one, or I will shorten it. Um, yeah, no, I'm going to just le read the last part of it and end on a note with, of hope because it's it is slightly longer, and it's called the Sierra: A History, and this is from the All the Fires of Wind and Light, uh, the Sierra: A History. 
Not long after lightning has rushed down the electric staircase of its own making, not long after fires five stories tall have swept up canyon, a new season the size of pearls begins. Silence is spreading like hands to touch the heads of seedlings and fiddlenecks nudging out by the hundreds. The burned and crackling world is not in shambles, not gone to ash and ash alone. Sapsucker, pileated, black-backed woodpeckers, all the join the jig of genetic diversity, all build from scratch. What do they crave? Riches, riches hidden in the wide open arches rising from gray. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, that was a perfect way to end the evening. Um, we're so grateful for you and grateful for your work um, and grateful that you could join us this evening. Um, and thanks to all of you who tuned in tonight. Um, we hope to see you next week. Um, good night. Thank you so much. I'll send references. <laughs>